Welcome to IB Chemistry exam preparation exam tips for both standard level and higher level. Today through our lesson, I'm going to continue with topic 6, kinetics, rate of chemical reactions for the standard level. We will continue by the collision theory. We will also discuss and explain the factors that affects the rate of the chemical reaction. So let's get started. The first thing that we need to start with is the collision theory. What is this theory about? We need to focus on three essential points when talking about the collision theory. For any reaction in order to occur or to take place, two reactants particles should fulfill the following points. So these conditions are so important for the particles in order for a chemical reaction to take place. The first point, the particles should collide with each other. So when the particles of reactants collide, of course, this may cause to have a chemical reaction at the end. The second point, the collision must be energetic enough in order to overcome the activation energy of the reaction. If the particles collide with less energy than the activation energy, they will not react. The particles will just bounce off each other. So, if talking about the collisions of the particles, not any two collisions may cause to have a chemical reaction. These collisions should have energy which is enough. When talking about the energy needed for the collisions, it should overcome the activation energy. So this energy should be either the same as the activation energy or higher. The third point, talking about the collisions also, the collisions must occur with the correct orientation or the correct alignment. They must bring the reactive parts of the particles into contact in the correct way. To explain more the meaning of correct orientation or correct geometrical alignment, we can look at the diagram which is presented at the bottom. Inside this small figure, I have carbon monoxide that reacts with oxygen molecule. Talking about the expected products, according to this chemical reaction, the products that should appear are carbon dioxide beside having a one single of oxygen atom. So in order to have this product, we need to look for both different alignments for the particles. In the first situation, you're going to find that the oxygen collides with the other oxygen from the second reactant. In this situation, we are not forming the carbon dioxide needed. Remember that the carbon dioxide is a double bond oxygen from one side and a double bond oxygen from the other side. So the carbon should be in the center. So in order to have a chemical reaction, the correct alignment or orientation for the particles should be as mentioned in the second diagram. In the second figure or the second diagram, you're going to find that the carbon this time collide with the oxygen molecule. In this situation, this collision may cause to have carbon dioxide formation. So this is considered a, co a correct alignment for the chemical reaction. So in this situation, we will have a product. When you want to study collision theory, make sure that you can outline these three different points as stating up the points. So they may ask about what are the main collision theory points or conditions needed for a chemical reaction. So you need to list them down. And the second thing you need to remember that not any two collisions can cause to have a chemical reaction at the end. 
These collagen should be number one. They have energy enough, so they should be energetic enough as mentioned in the second point. And number two, they should have a correct orientation. in order to form a product. Now we're going to continue with the factors that affects the rate of chemical reaction. Anything that can increase the frequency of successful collisions between reactant particles will speed up the chemical reaction. When talking about frequency, this is a very important key word when considering factors affecting the rate of chemical reaction. So what is frequency? The frequency is the number of collisions per unit of time. Through all the factors that we're going to discuss, when we want to explain the effect of the factor, we need to remember the word of frequency. Inside the past paper, you can write frequency of collisions or successful collisions, or you can consider the number of collisions per unit of time. You cannot simply write collisions number. You need to consider per unit of time or to use the word of frequency. Going back another time. So what are the factors that affect the rate of chemical reactions? We're going to discuss each factor. We have the temperature factor. We have the concentration factor. We have the pressure factor. We have the surface area factor. And finally, we have adding a catalyst. I'm going a little bit to label number two and three besides number four. When we want to discuss the concentration factor, remember that the concentration, it is for aqueous solutions. So if you want to study the concentration factor, you need to increase or to decrease an aqueous solution concentration, not a solid, not a gas, and not a liquid. For the pressure, we are talking about gases. So in order to have the effect of the pressure on the rate of a chemical reaction, inside your balanced chemical equation, there should be a gas. Could be all of them gases, or perhaps one gas as a reactant or one gas as a product. And I have now the surface area. For the surface area, I'm talking about the solid reactants. Here, when I'm considering the surface area, I'm not talking about the surface area of the flask or the beaker into which the chemical reaction is taking place. It is the solid reactant which could be presented inside the chemical reaction. We're going to discuss each factor individually. Starting with the first factor, which is the effect of concentration on the rate of chemical reaction. Here, another time, we need to remember that we are going through aqueous reactants when we want to change the concentration. I have here a small diagram that can help us to understand what is the effect of concentration on the rate of chemical reaction. In diagram number one, we can find that we have lower concentration, but in diagram number two, we have higher concentration. As a comparison, you're going to find that the number of particles as amount is totally different. So in diagram one, I have only two red colors and I have two yellows. On the second side, the number of red color particles increases. So if you want to count them, they are in total being five. And also the yellow is increased up as a total of five. So now, what will happen another time to the frequency, remember this is a key word, of collisions? Of course, if you have more particles, so the number of collisions per unit of time, it will increase. So based on that, the frequency of collisions increases and the rate of the chemical reaction will increase. 
So as a summary, what do you need to know? For the concentration factor, when the concentration of reactants increases, of course, the rate of chemical reaction will also increase. If you are asked to explain why, remember to use these two essential points in your answer. The first point, when the concentration increases, the amount of particles will increase. When talking about amount, we are talking about mole number of particles, since the mole is directly affected by the concentration. So if the amount of particles of reactant increases, of course, what will happen to the frequency of collision? As a second point, the frequency of collisions increases. So remember that whenever the concentration increase, of course, the rate of chemical reaction will increase as well. And for the explanation, make sure to take these two points inside your answer. Now we will look at the effect of concentration if we have a graph. So inside this graph, you're going to find on the Y total volume of gas collected in cubic centimeter. And you have here the time in seconds. We have three different curves and each one is according to the concentration that have been used for the acid, which was added to a solid. In diagram or graph number A, you're going to find that two molarity is used. Here I have one molarity. And finally, for the C, I have a half molarity. If we want to make a small comparison between each of the curves, which are obtained according to your diagram, you need to compare two essential points. The first thing, the steepness of the curve. Here, if you remember, in our previous lesson, we studied together how can we determine the initial rate of reaction or the average or the instantaneous rate. And we considered previously that how steep is the curve is related to the rate of chemical reaction. So if we look at curve number A, you're going to find that it is the steepest. And when we want to compare how steep is the curve, we look at the line, how close is it from the y-axis. So if it's closer to the y-axis, of course, it is considered as being steeper. So after that comes the curve B, which is in between compared to curve A and C. And finally, curve C, which is the least in steepness. So from here, we can conclude that since curve A is the steepest, so of course, it is the fastest when we consider the rate of the chemical reaction. Now, if we consider a second point in your comparison, you can look at the time needed for the reaction to complete or to finish. If you look at curve A, you're going to find that exactly at 20 seconds, the chemical reaction reaches completion. While for curve B, it took 40 seconds in order to reach completion. And finally for curve C, it didn't finish till the 60. So perhaps it will finish after 60. So it's not clear inside this diagram when curve C will reach completion. So another time, since curve A, it's faster. So the time taken for the reaction to reach completion was less than the time taken for curve B. So from here, we're going to do a lot of application on the factors that affect the rate of chemical reaction on graphs. And this is so essential and important for your external and for your exam. Remember to compare the steepness of the curve and remember also to look for the time at which the chemical reaction reaches completion. 
if the curve is steeper of course the rate of chemical reaction will be higher and it will be faster reaction and the time that is needed in order to finish the chemical reaction it will be the smallest continuing now with another factor that affects the rate of chemical reaction which is the pressure factor when we want to consider the pressure we need to remember that the chemical reaction should include at least one gas so the effect of increasing the pressure in case of reaction involving gases another time let's look at the diagram and let's compare between both so for the first diagram which is a you can find that you have a three orange particles and it's the same exactly for diagram b you have another a three and if you consider the white particles which are the second reactant presented inside my reaction vessel I have in total five and I have also five so if I want to compare the amount of reactants if I want to compare the concentration of these reactants I'm going to find that they are the same exactly so here what is the factor that I am studying here it is actually another factor which is the pressure so what's happening I'm trying here to apply on a pressure by pushing down the plunger in order to have the second diagram which is B so if I want to compare the pressure between A and B I'm going to find that the pressure in A is high it's lower sorry but the pressure in B is higher now the second thing that we need to compare and here we need to remember that we have a relationship between the pressure and between the volume according to Boyle's law so the volume here is higher and here the volume is, is smaller and this is so obvious if you want to compare the volume between A and B so if we look at A since we have higher volume it will be less collisions per unit of time between the particles because the particles are far from each other so if they have larger volume definitely the space or the distance between the particles is far away and the collisions which are expected it will be lower if we compare it with the second diagram into which we have more collisions per unit of time as a frequency of collisions and the particles are near each other so how can now we summarize so for the pressure factor what do we need to know when the pressure of reaction involving gases increases definitely the rate of chemical reaction will increase so if the pressure increases the rate of the reaction will also increase and when we want to go through the explanation we need to remember these two essential points when the pressure increases the particles of reactants they become closer to each other why they will become closer due to the decrease in the volume so when the pressure increases the volume will decrease so the particles become closer and when the particles become close to each other this will cause to increase the frequency of collisions per unit of volume and this is so important to be written when you want to have an explanation on the pressure effect so these are the two essential points needed when you want to study continuing with the surface area effect on the rate of the chemical reaction remember that when we want to study surface area so we are talking about the solid particles 
Inside the chemical reactions, of course, we have some reactants which are presented in the solid state. So, for example, if we add Mg to the hydrochloric acid, the Mg added is solid. So, I can talk about the surface area effect of magnesium in this situation. Or, for the chemical reaction between calcium, carbonate, and HCl, this is also presented in the solid state. So, yes, I can also talk about the surface area effect. But for the hydrochloric acid, since both of them are aqueouses, so, of course, I'm talking here about the concentration. So, let's return back another time to the third factor, which is the surface area factor. Now, for the surface area factor, which is in case of having a solid, we need to look for what happens when the surface area increases on the rate of chemical reaction. We need firstly to compare the different surface areas for different solids. So if we look back to the diagram, we're going to find that suppose that this is calcium carbonate. And let's say that inside the chemical reaction, I took exactly one gram of this calcium carbonate. If you look at this diagram, you're going to find that the solid presented here, it is large lumps. If we have a large lumps and we want to consider the surface area, the surface area in this situation is considered smaller, it's low surface area. So if you have a cube like this of any solid which is presented inside your chemical reaction, let's say that we have the mass which is one gram of calcium carbonate according to the example. And here I have large lumps. And I took the same mass, then I make it into smaller particles. So I cut them into smaller pieces and also into more uh, small pieces. So I turn it into, let's say, a powder. So I crush it. I'm taking the same mass. I'm not uh, changing the total amount of solid. But in my first situation, I took large lumps and in my second situation I took small lumps. So uh, this is powder. So the point here that we need to compare between is which one of these two situations got larger surface area. When talking about larger surface area or oh, the surface area of the cube I'm trying here to draw arrows that presents the surface area. If we want to consider the powder situation, so imagine what happens to the surface area since you take it into a powder form. Definitely the small lumps, which is powder, it will have larger surface area and here a smaller surface area. So it is very important to recognize, so you need to recognize that the powder solid, which is considered the small lumps, it has larger surface area than large solid lumps. And this factor is studied only whenever we have solid reactants. To remember this, you can take something from our life if you want to prepare your cup of tea and you want to add sugar, of course, if you look for a smaller powder sugar cubes, it will dissolve faster. Definitely in this example, it's not a chemical reaction, but of course, the dissolving process would be faster. The same situation here. The smaller powder, it has larger surface area compared with the large lumps. Continuing with the second diagram now, if you look at the second diagram, here I have my large lumps and here I have my powder. So you can start thinking about the frequency of collisions. So you will look for that you have more particles 
and definitely you have larger surface area so there is a possibility for the second reactant to collide more with the surface of the second reactant causing to have faster rate of reaction so from here for the surface area factor when the surface area of solid increases definitely the rate of chemical reaction remember it will increase and when you want to go through the explanation number one when the surface area increases the number of solid particles will increase and this will cause to increase remember this keyword which is frequency of collisions I've got here a small question. The question is, explain why powder calcium carbonate has faster rate of reaction with hydrochloric acid compared with large lumps of calcium carbonate. Definitely, if talking about powder as discussed previously, it will have larger surface area. So let's look at the answer. When using powder solid, its surface area is larger compared with the large lumps this will give greater number of solid particles I'm underlining here the essential points that should be mentioned inside your explanation therefore the frequency of collisions it will increase causing to have faster rate of chemical reaction in question number two, a student performed two experiments to investigate the effect of solid surface area on the rate of reaction. The data obtained were plotted as shown in the graph below. Select and explain which curve presents the use of a small lumps powder and which one is for the large lumps. Remember, the powder should be faster. When talking about faster, so it should be steeper. So if you look at both curves, I have the blue and I have the red one. The first thing I need to answer myself, which one is steeper? So which one is faster? Start thinking. Of course, the blue one is steeper. It is closer to the y-axis. So it is faster. And this one is slower. And you can also find that the time taken for the blue curve to reach completion is before the red one. So definitely it's faster. So since it is faster, of course, here I have my powder calcium carbonate solid. So let's look at the answer. Experiment B used powder solid since the curve has a steeper slope, which indicates having faster rate of chemical reaction. Moreover, the reaction reached completion within a shorter period of time. When you use powder solid, the number of particles will increase, causing to increase the frequency of collisions, and therefore this will increase the rate of chemical reaction. We have now a very important factor which is the effect of temperature on the rate of chemical reaction. In order to understand the effect of temperature and to, in order to refer on the way of explanation, we need to start discussing together what's called by Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve. Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve is so essential into which we're going later to explain it and we're going also to focus on how to draw. For your exam, it is so important to draw the curve. So let's learn together how can we draw it. If we look at the curve, we're going to find that it is made up of a Y and an X axis. Let's look at what's the Y and the X. So I have probability of particles with kinetic energy and I have on the X the kinetic energy. So I will start with you step by step drawing this curve. So I have the Y and I have the X axis. 
you need to learn how to draw it. It is so essential. On the x-axis, you need to write kinetic energy. You need to memorize the labeling. You need to label the y and the x correctly. And on the, on the y-axis, you have the probability of particles. Or inside the past paper, we can use instead of the probability of particles, we can also use the proportion of particles. We're going to understand what is the meaning of probability or proportion later. Now, on your curve, you need to draw what happens to the particles when the temperature increases. So let's start together drawing. The first curve that you're going to draw on your diagram, it is for T1, which is considered low temperature. According to my drawing, remember, you need to start from the zero, then you need to have a curve, then you're going to make it constant at the end. This is labeled as T1, which is the low temperature. Now, on your diagram, you're going to label a position for the activation energy. You can put the activation energy any place you want after the middle part of your curve. So I'm going to label it here and I'm going to write the activation energy. I have in this diagram an area, which is the area under the curve which is from the activation energy and higher. What is this area stands for? This area, it's the proportion of particles. So the area presents the proportion Or you can use the word of probability of particles with sufficient energy. Equals or higher to the activation energy. What do we mean by that? If you remember, at the beginning of our lesson, we stated before that the collisions should have energy enough, and this energy should equal to the activation energy or higher. The area under the curve, it presents for me what's called by the proportion or the probability of the particles which have a sufficient amount of energy. What is the meaning of probability or what is the meaning of a proportion. I'm going to discuss this little bit with you so using a simple example here. Suppose that you have a container and inside the container you have these particles of reactants. I'm going to have a blue color which are for the particles which got low a temperature or low energy presented. So at the first situation and the second one, which is the red, they are the particles which have got sufficient energy. So the red is sufficient energy needed. So the red ones, if they collide, they may form for me a chemical reaction since they have a sufficient amount of energy. If I want to consider what is the proportion or what is the fraction or what is the probability of these, I'm going to count how many particles do I have. I have three, 
compared to the total number of particles presented inside my container, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven. So it is three divided over seven. So what is my proportion of the particles which have got sufficient amount of energy? It is three over seven only. This is in case of low temperature. Now, what happens if you want to increase the temperature? So now we're going to learn what I'm going now to do for my curve when drawing. Remember that when you want to draw, the curve should be shorter, wider, and lower, and it should shift little bit to the right. Okay, this is so essential and important. I said shorter, wider, and shifts to the right. This one is T2, which is considered as a high temperature. Now, the activation energy, it will not be affected. But what will happen now? In this situation, where is my area under the curve that presents the proportion or the fraction or the probability of particles with sufficient amount of energy? It will be higher. It will be all this area. So this fraction, it will increase. So if I want to go back to my example to understand this more, so I will have more red colors. So instead of having only three, the red colors particles which got sufficient energy, they will increase actually. So I have now one, two, three, four, five, six, and maybe one only is considered as being blue with low energy. So now what's my new fraction or probability or possibility? It is now six divided over seven. So I increase this area. This curve is called by Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve. When you want to study the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve, make sure that you know how to draw both curves and to label the Y and the X. You need also to label the activation energy. You can put it anywhere after the middle part from your curve. The activation energy position for T1 and T2, it is not affected. It's the area under the curve that will increase. Remember that T2 high temperature should be shorter, wider, and shift to the right. Let's go back to the diagram drawn above. So I have here T1, which is my low temperature. And both curves start from the zero. This is essential for the mark scheme. Now what happened to my black? It is shorter, wider, a shift to the right. So this is T2, which is my high temperature. I've got here my activation energy, which is labeled right here. So I have a line. Where is my area under the curve for T1? It is this area. I'm going to label it as a blue color. Now for your external, when you want to label for the higher temperature, you can only label the extra area so it's the red one no need to relabel the blue we knew previously that it is the red and the blue together now we're going to learn how can we explain the effect of temperature using maxwell boltzmann distribution curve so remember that when the temperature increases definitely the rate of the chemical reaction will also increase when you want to explain, you need to refer back to the following points. Number one, you need to write that the mean velocity of the particle increases. Number two, the frequency of collisions will increase. And the fraction of particles which have sufficient kinetic energy, which equals to the activation energy or higher, will increase. The third point, it is so important for the mark. 
and I can rewrite it in another way. So I can write the fraction of particles with you can use this abbreviation energy larger than or equal to the activation energy will increase therefore the frequency of collisions also increases the third point it is directly related to Maxwell Boltzmann distribution curve as the area under the curve Point number two and three, they are so essential for the temperature effect. Now I have some past paper questions as paper one. On the following Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution, which letter represents the activation energy? So I have A, D, B, and C. Which one is for the activation energy? It's for the B, so we're going to circle B. I have another multiple choice also taken from paper one. The graph shows the Maxwell-Boltzmann energy distribution curve for a given gas at a certain temperature. So I have the proportion of molecules and I have the kinetic energy. How will the curve change if the temperature of the gas increased while the other conditions remain constant? So A is for the low temperature. If it increases, of course, it will become shorter, wider, and it will shift a little bit to the right. So if we look at the choices, the maximum, which is the top of the curve, it will become lower. So it is either C or D. And it will shift to the right of A. So the answer, it's a C answer. Now we're going to continue with the last factor that may affect the rate of chemical reaction, which is the catalyst factor. Of course, the catalyst as a definition, we need to refer for it. A catalyst is a substance added to the chemical reaction in order to increase its rate without being consumed during the reaction. So the catalyst as the end of the chemical reaction can be separated using different separation techniques and can be reused another time. So it's not a reactant. It is only added to increase the chemical reaction. Of course, based on chapter number three and previously in the energetic chapter, we have two different types of catalysts. We have homogeneous catalyst and we have heterogeneous one. For the homogeneous, it's the same state as the reactant and the heterogeneous, it is for different state. We can consider the types of catalyst if you go back to the lesson which is about ozone, considering the depletion inside the energetic chapter. I have now the catalyst factor. What's its effect? When a catalyst is added to a chemical reaction, the rate of chemical reaction will increase. Now the point is why? What can a catalyst do for the rate of chemical reaction? How it will increase? So I will go back here to the explanation. I have two essential points. The first point, a catalyst, it lowers the activation energy. So it will lower the barrier, which is needed to initiate the chemical reaction. So if it is lower, of course the chemical reaction will be faster. And it provides an alternative pathway for the reaction. I wrote down the word of AND as in the mark scheme, when you want to write the first point for your explanation of a catalyst, you cannot only write down lowers the activation energy. You should also include and provides alternative pathway for the reaction. To understand the meaning of alternative pathway for the reaction, I'm going to discuss it later when I'm going to discuss the catalyst effect on the energy profile or diagram. Now, point number two, the fraction of particles with sufficient amount of energy, which equals to the activation energy or higher, will increase, causing to increase the frequency of successful collision. This point is the same point as the temperature effect. So in this situation, the fraction or the probability of particles with energy higher or equal to the activation energy, it will increase. And this will, of course, will increase the frequency of collisions. So the point here, do we have Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve for the catalyst effect? Yes. So now we're going to look for the Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve for the catalyst. 
it is easier than for the temperature. Another time, you need to know how to draw Maxwell-Boltzmann distribution curve in case of a catalyst effect. So I'm going now draw with you the curve step by step. So I have the X and the Y. It's the same labeling as previous. So here I have the kinetic energy. And here I have the probability of particles. Another time you can use instead of the probability the word of fraction. When we're going to start, we need to start from the zero, then we have a curve, then it becomes constant like this. After that, we will label a place for the activation energy. So I'm going to put it right here. And I'm going to write that this one is the activation energy with out a catalyst. Now, where is the fraction or the probability of particles with energy equals to the activation energy or higher? I'm going to label it my using the red color. Now, when you add a catalyst to the, to the chemical reaction, what will happen? The activation energy, it will be lower. So it will become closer to the zero. So you need to draw another activation energy and you will find that the area, it will increase and it will become larger. So the fraction of particles will become larger. I'm going only to label the extra region. Of course, in this situation, you will label all of these, but it's no need for that. So I'm going to remove it and I will leave only the blue colors, the blue circles one. So let's go back another time. So this is my activation energy. It is with a catalyst. So remember that it is with a catalyst, it will be lower. So let's go to the diagram above. So you have here only one curve. It's not two as the temperature. You need to label two different activation energies. One is higher activation energy, which is without a catalyst. So this is without. And the second one, it is with. The area, it will be different. So this is my area under the curve, which is for the fraction of particles with energy equals to the activation energy or higher if you don't have a catalyst. But if you have a catalyst, it will be this extra region. And this causes to increase the frequency of collisions. Now we're going to go through how the catalyst provides an alternative pathway for the reaction. In order to understand how a catalyst provides an alternative pathway for the reaction, we need to refer to energetic chapter and we need to go back to the energy profile or energy diagram for both endothermic and exothermic chemical reactions. If you remember, we have two different curves, one for endothermic and the other one is for exothermic. And we took this inside energy, energetic chapter. If we want to go through the labeling part to remember how to draw. So I have the X and I have the Y. Remember that the Y, it is the energy. And here you have the reaction pathway. If you have an endothermic chemical reaction, so the reactance level will be below and the products will be above. So this is my reactance and here I have my products. If you want to label the activation energy, it is from the reactance level to reach the top of your curve. And this one is the activation energy with out a catalyst. Now what will happen 
when you add a catalyst, you will change the path of the reaction. So you need to draw a new path. And this path, it will be lower with energy, which is the activation energy. If you look at the way of a drawing, you need to start from the reactance level the same. There is no change. And you continue to the product level. Then you will join between them by a new curve. And this should be with lower activation energy. Now, when you want to label the activation energy, so it is the activation energy with a catalyst. So in this situation, the pathway for the reaction, it will be different. So the reaction will have different path. In this second path, it's with lower energy compared with the first path. You need to be familiar on how can you draw the energy profile with and without a catalyst. So yes, you need to know how to draw the new path. And this is one of the past paper questions. So going back another time to the diagram, I have the reactance level right here. And I have the products level, which is for the endothermic chemical reaction. This is the activation energy, which is without a catalyst. And with a catalyst, it will be lower. As you can see, there is a new path for the reaction. You need to go through the exothermic diagram, profile diagram. The reactants, they are above and the products, they are below. So if you want to label the activation energy, this is without a catalyst. And with a catalyst, it will be lower. So you need to make sure that you know how to draw the energy profile with and without catalyst besides labeling the activation energy with and without catalyst. Now, if you look at the delta H, you're going to find that the enthalpy change is not affected. It is constant. So for the enthalpy, which is the energy released or absorbed from the chemical reaction according to the type of chemical reaction, it's not affected by the addition of catalyst. It is only the activation energy that it will be lower and it will provide an alternative pathway, another pathway for the reaction, which is with lower activation energy. I'm going now to stop and we're going to continue later on how can the factors that affect the rate of chemical reaction be affecting your drawing or your new new curves. This would be our new lesson. So thank you for today.